I want to talk this morning about God's judgment and mercy. And the Bible is a <coughs> deeply hopeful book. And it is the story of God's promise to renew, redeem and restore the entire creation. And it's a manifesto really of grace and forgiveness. Or it could be termed a catalogue of new beginnings. <coughs> and notice uh, this wonderful hope uh, of grace and forgiveness is painted against a backlog of human sin and human failure. Sometimes uh, that, that hope shines like a beacon, really bright, because it's against a backdrop of darkness where most of the world are in darkness and sin. And it shines really bright. And when we look at the pages of Scripture, in these pages we have a record of some good but mostly wicked kings of Israel and rebellious Israelites. The populace was led into that by their leaders. And we hear over and over again an endless <coughs> lament. You hear it right through those books of Kings and Chronicles. They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Extremely sad to hear that. And the story is anything but pretty. Uh, there are moments of grandeur uh, and faithfulness. And we read about Abraham, we read about Moses, David, Solomon, and uh, others. Hezekiah comes to mind. Uh, remember Hezekiah was ill and he was told Isaiah went in and told him that he would die to get his affairs in order. And he turned and he wept and he cried to the Lord to heal him. And God sent Isaiah straight back in again to tell him he had another 15 years. Now that 15 years actually meant that he begot another son, Manasseh. And Manasseh was one of the most evil kings that there was, extremely evil. And uh, in Second Chronicles 33, <coughs> Second Chronicles 33 and, and verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem, an extremely long reign. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He really went to town on doing evil. And it's funny that quite often you see righteous kings and the sons coming after do the opposite. I wonder the sons just go the opposite way to their dad, you know, to their father. Uh, for he built high places which Hezekiah had broken down. He raised up altars for the Baals and made wooden images and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He even put these altars in the house of the Lord and an idol in the house of the Lord. And he, he burned his sons, the children in the fire to a, an idol. Burned his children in the fire. And God actually, I'm not going to read all about that, he was an extremely evil man. God sent uh, the Assyrian king who took him away to Assyria. And Manasseh, believe it or not, repented. Repented. And God forgave him and brought him back to his throne and to his position. And that's how merciful God is. And that was a man you would have thought, he deserves the chop. He really does. He needs to be removed. He went back and he began to break down all the idols and clear them out of the road. He took the idol out of the temple. And you can read that in the following uh, sections there. And in Second Chronicles uh, and Kings as well. You can read that. But God was extremely merciful. But it's an example of the evil that was in Israel and how many people did he influence by his example. King leaders do that, they influence people. And of course, as we read through the pages of Kings and Chronicles, we have a record of a headlong rush to self-destruction of Israel and Judah. And we see their wicked kings tumble into exile. You've heard of lemmings running, running over a cliff. Well, it was like that. Tumble into exile like lemmings over a cliff. And finally, we read these 
hard words of judgment that sum up the last 400 years or so of Israel's history in 2 Chronicles 36, a couple of chapters on, verses 15 and 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them. This is Judah here. Sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. He saw what they were suffering because they were sinning. And he had warned them away at the beginning before they entered the land through Moses. He said, you know, if you keep these commandments, you'll be blessed in every way. Blessings will follow you, just like an automatic law. And Christ talks about, you know, you get, you, you get the measure you give. If you judge, you'll be judged. And he says, don't judge those things. Well, they, they really were warned. And they, uh, verse 16, they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Now just think of those words. There was no remedy. And of course they went into exile. And we, we don't he hear the theme of judgment these days too much. We hear a lot about grace and forgiveness and so we should of course. So we should. For that's the heart of the gospel. Uh, grace and judgment aren't opposites. They're complementary. And those, the words we read there, they're extremely hard. The wrath of God against his people became so great there was no remedy. <coughs> extremely hard. Um, <clears throat> Judah, of course, refused to admit that the nation had sinned. The prophets came to them and warned them, and they refused to admit, this is our way of living. Just like the people today. <laughs> get sounded out as to, you know, politicians, instead of taking decisions, they sound out, and the nation actually decides, even though the nation may be wrong. Is there a righteous leader who stands up and says, that's wrong, this is the way it should be done? And we hear these things regularly. Judah certainly refused to admit that sin, their kings and leading citizens wouldn't listen to the warnings either from the prophets, and they killed many of them, put them to death, chased them out of the country. And Jesus referred to this in Luke 11, uh, 49. Luke 11, 49. <coughs> He's talking here to the scribes and Pharisees and uh, He's, in verse 47, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel, to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation, and it was. For the Romans demolished Jerusalem, took, chased the Jews out of the country altogether, took many of them away as slaves, killed many. Jerusalem is surrounded by crosses, by people crucified during the siege of Jerusalem, 70 AD. Terrible time. And they were, they, they killed the greatest prophet of all, Christ. They killed the greatest <coughs> prophet of all. And in Revelation 2 and 3, of course, uh, Jesus uh, talks to the individual churches, uh, pointing out their faithfulness and then drawing attention to where they weren't faithful, where they were sinning. And they needed a change, and, the, and we'll just turn to Revelation 2 here. In the church of Ephesus, verse 1, uh, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know your works, your labor, your patience, 
and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have laboured for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you are fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So Christ encourages them, but points out for the need to repent. He calls for repentance. And in John 3, verse 20, John 3, verse 20, that's the Gospel of John. Verse 20. Christ says here, he says, that's 3, verse 20, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. See, those who sin don't want their deeds exposed. Israel didn't want their deeds exposed. The scribes and Pharisees didn't either. But a Christian does come to the light. In 1 John 1, in the epistle, 1 John 1, And verse 9. In verse 8 it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As Christians, we, we come to the light. David uh, cried out to God. We can read in the Psalms, Examine, examine me, O Lord, and know my heart and see if there, any, if there be any wicked way in me. You know, know my heart and my mind. David asked God to examine him. In 1 Corinthians 11, um, Paul says, let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. He was talking about the Lord's Supper time there at the Passover season. And let a man examine himself. That's uh, 1 Corinthians 11. I, I, And, uh, let's see, yes, uh, yes, verse 28, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. They were doing things in a rather wrong way there when they were uh, partaking of the bread and the wine. And uh, David asked that too, as I say, and, and uh, Paul says in the same chapter here, he says, if you would judge yourselves, you wouldn't be judged. See, if we go to God and ask him to show us things that we may not even be aware of, because as a Christian, it's a, it's a work in progress. We are in Christ, and when the Father looks, we're covered by Christ's righteousness, and we are, when Christ appears, we will appear with him. We'll be resurrected and we'll have glorious bodies. But as we walk along in the flesh, we do fall down from time to time. And we go and ask God to show us. Examine me, Lord, and show me. And God shows us and we change. We have, God has given us the Holy Spirit and he works in us and changes us. But we need to go to the light or we won't see that we're sinning. We carry on maybe sinning and that there would be disastrous. But judgment really means telling the truth. You hear uh, politicians talking about, let's have a truth uh, thing. <laughs> Remember in South Africa they had this. Uh, at least it was supposed to be where everyone would sit down and confess and tell the truth and there'd be no, uh, there would be an amnesty sort of thing where no one would be sent to jail or pay the ultimate penalty or anything like that. Uh, whether people would actually tell the truth in a situation like that is another matter. But judgment means telling the truth. And when we go before God and open our hearts and ask God to examine us, he'll show us things. He'll draw our attention to them. And it may be by bringing us into a situation where we see from the way we react in that situation that we have a weakness. Maybe coldness towards an individual or something like that. 
I'll say, I would uh, just touch on a couple of important thoughts about the biblical theme of God's judgment that we find reflected here at this terrible moment in Israel's history. And the first is that God gives to us human beings who are made in his image the dignity of responsibility. Israel went into exile because people failed to listen to his warnings. Failed to observe his laws and thought that it didn't matter, that they knew better. And we are called to live responsibly before God. How we conduct our lives and relationships, how we do our work, how we use the talents God has given us to each, to each of us. Everyone God has given talents. All these have eternal significance. And of course we live in a society where many people believe there is no sin. It's no fault anywhere. You do what you like. What sits comfortably with you? Go ahead. Do it. And this can lead us, it can lead people to think that some of our, their most weighty decisions and actions have no consequences. Uh, we have heard over the years about the rainforests and um, the nations have agreed, did agree that they would try to save these forests and not continue the logging practices that were being carried out in Africa and South America where huge, vast rainforests were being cut down and logs were floated down the rivers for commercial, to be sold commercially. And that does have a big impact on our weather. The, the forests, those forests have been described as the lungs of the world, where they give out oxygen and take in the carbon dioxide. Also the seas, there are little diatoms and different creatures in the sea which do the same thing. And yet our seas are being polluted. The, the, a big example was that over in the Caribbean, there where BT had that uh, well down undersea drilling, etc., and it blew. And that had a, a devastating effect on the, on the sea in that area. And recently I was reading uh, with the flooding from the heavy rain down at Loch Ness, uh, when the, the flood water began to recede, the whole ground was covered with plastic. Dirt and plastic and filth that people just discard. And uh, I saw another, I think it was a documentary, it showed a humpback whale, a huge creature, and the fishing boat was, was out and it came over near the fishing boat up beside it. And in the, 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 the humpback has these large uh, white baleen, uh, I think you call them, and they filter water through these and then that, uh, they filter the water out and they retain <coughs> the food. And there was a huge plastic thing stuck in and the whale couldn't feed. And it seemed to know that it could get help from the fishing boat. And it was over beside the fishing boat and the fishermen were able to extract it, pull it out, and the whale went out and jumped up in the air and plunged away down to feed as it normally would. And I thought that was tremendous. But how that creature seemed to sense that it would get help. These are God's creatures and it's God's earth. And he's going to have to renew it because of what we as a human race are doing to it. It's terrible. But it's as if we can go through life without any real responsibility for our actions. We, people seem to think, well, there won't be any consequences. You know, you drive behind the car, the window opens and a bag of rubbish is thrown out on the, on the road. Who's supposed to lift it? The taxpayer will lift it. Yeah, we, we don't live throw away disposable lives, brethren. We don't. The entire Bible agrees that we are accountable for our lives in relation to God and to people, to people. And that's both now and in the final day of judgment. And it's one of the basic tenets of our Christian faith that Jesus Christ shall come to judge the living and the dead. He will come to judge. Remember he said, all judgment in heaven and earth has been given unto me. In Acts chapter 10,
and verse 42. Acts 10, 42. <clears throat> and in verse 42, And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. So Christ will come and Christ will judge. And of course, judgment simply means we are responsible for our lives. We're answerable for our actions and our attitudes. And responsibility, it's woven into human dignity. It's woven into it. And dignity is the word. Because when you begin to probe behind the idea of human responsibility, you begin to see that our choices and our actions as humans really matter. What we choose to do really matters. Our loving God has conferred on us the burden of meaning and significance. A human being isn't just something that appears and it doesn't matter, they disappear and that's it. There is meaning and significance. We are born in his image. We are, we are in his image. We are important to God and we're important to his purpose. And that being so, then what we do with our lives matters. Matters. Israel mattered to God. They were God's chosen people to bear his blessing to the nations. And they never really believed that. They never did it. In fact, they erected barriers. So the Gentile, dogs. Samaritans, the same. Oh yes, they didn't try to reach out. And uh, Peter, in one of his epistles here, tells us how God looks on us. First Peter 2. First Peter 2 and verse 9. And this is what Israel was supposed to be. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So you and I are not cosmic accidents. Our lives are not ruled by fate. We can't merely float with the current uh, of life like a jellyfish or a, or a water bug. We can't do that. We're God-created human beings. And we have a purpose. We have God-given gifts. And we're called for a mission in the world. And we can't be behave any way we please and expect that it's not going to make a difference. It makes a huge difference because God loves us and we matter. We matter. A second thought is on God's judgment. We have the, significant, the dignity of choice, of choice. And it's important to remember that this the moment in Israel's history wasn't some sudden thunderclap of judgment out of the blue. It just didn't happen out of the blue. God's judgment boiled up after years of disobedience when Israel was unfaithful. Over and over, they and their leaders chose to abandon their calling, embodied in the law that God gave them, in order to be like everybody else. They felt, well, it's interesting what the Moabites are doing and what the Philistines are at and, and so forth. It, it wasn't a sudden thing. It was incremental. <coughs> and it didn't happen a day in a year or a decade, but it happened over centuries, over a long time. And our lives are made up of choices. Choices that we make every day and choices to care or not to care. Choices to love or turn away. Choices to live for ourselves. Gratify our own needs or care about those around us. That's what our choices involve. And the bottom line is, will we choose to live responsibly and obediently before God or not? And deep down, we all know how it works. 
When a relationship collapses into bitterness and recrimination, it isn't the preceding few days or weeks that account for it, but it's the choices made over years. Made over years. We make choices to be silent when we should talk and share our thoughts, but we choose to be silent. To withdraw in anger rather than risk confrontation, open our heart and reveal what we're really feeling and thinking. And men probably suffer more from this than women. Yeah, we stop sharing our thoughts and maybe we Work becomes too much of a priority and we aren't spending time at home with our wives or and our children. And maybe some do seem to get the deepest satisfaction in work rather than in the family. Why do children and fathers become strangers to each other? It's all those choices over the years that hardens hearts. It deadens love and destroys relationships. I know a social worker who told me that she talks to teens every week and male and female and they can't talk to their parents. Can't talk to their parents. They wouldn't go to their parents with the problem because the parent hasn't time. They're not there. And parents are busy <coughs> and it's Satan has engineered, engineered society in such a way that they are too busy. The important things are relationships. That's the important thing. Instead of that, people are involved in things. Oh yes, we're going skiing or we're going on a, a walk around the, the North Pole. Or, those things may be admirable in themselves. But not what it involves removing parents from children for long periods. Not at all. We need to realise, brethren, that our little daily choices build up like snow and ice on a glacier. And you know how they can drill into a glacier and they take up a cylinder uh, with a cylinder of ice right down, and it goes away down maybe for centuries. And they can tell from that what happens in those periods. It's amazing what they can tell. And it, it's just, our little daily choices are like that. And God can see our heart. He knows. He knows. Psalm 139, remember David said, You, my, you know my uprising and my downsitting. You knew my life before I was born, he said. You wove me together in my mother's womb. Our thoughts are open. We're an open book to God. But we have to go to him, even though he knows. He wants us to come to him and to say, Father, this is me. And talk to him. Tell him what we are. And he gives us peace and heals the hurts. He heals the hurts. Yeah, each choice by which I act with love, integrity, courage, and conviction, increases my capacity to choose the right thing until it becomes <coughs> difficult to choose the wrong thing. First John 3 talks about uh, those who practice righteousness are righteous. And this is practicing righteousness, making the right choices. But those who don't practice righteousness, they practice evil. And that had those, both those ways, those choices have an effect. Each act of surrender and cowardice, each indulgence in selfishness, and we do sometimes indulge ourselves, weakens me and you and opens the path for more such acts. It's easier to do the same thing again once you do it, until eventually you lose your freedom, you lose your freedom. And ironically, we lose our freedom precisely through what feels to us like the exercise of our freedom. Yeah, I'm free to choose. I like this. I'll do this. 
maybe the wrong thing. Because what are we gauging the right choice? What are we gauging our choices by? This should be what we gauge our choices by. God's Word. We have the Sermon on the Mount. We have all the ex exposition of the Apostles and Paul right through the New Testament. to guide us. And we have counsellors. We can talk to people and get advice. There's no... There are ways to get the right advice. We should... Some people don't seek that, of course. Yes, what seems to us like the exercise of our freedom is actually the opposite. Freedom is not the ability to do anything we want to do. Freedom is the increasing ability to do the right thing. To do the right thing. And that's what Paul calls the freedom of the Spirit. And doing evil, making wrong choices is not freedom, it's slavery and ends in hardness of heart. Our hearts get hard, our conscience gets, uh, it doesn't respond if we do uh, a seriously wrong thing. The conscience maybe is dead because we've done that before. Ephesians 4.17 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to licentiousness to work all on cleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned in Christ. So there were people here who uh, weren't informing themselves as to what God's thoughts and ideas were. No, they were doing what they wanted to do. And it, they were making wrong choices. And it hardened them. So they were insensitive. They were insensitive. And it goes on down here and, and says in... Uh, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man is grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. And by making the right choices, that happens. God is working with us, and that happens. So living by the Spirit, choosing God's loving commands, brings moral and spiritual freedom. C.S. Lewis uh, reflected on this human capacity uh, and responsibility to make choices. And he said that every time you make a choice, you're turning the central part of you, the part that chooses, that center, into something a little different than it was before. And when you take your life as a whole, with all its innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning that central thing into a creature that is either in harmony with God and with other human beings and with itself or else into one that's in a state of war with God and with other creatures and with itself. You're doing one or the other. And each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state or the other. But is that it? Is, do our wrong choices doom us? With our habitual patterns locked in places, there's no turning back. Thankfully, we aren't the only one making choices. God also makes choices, and he chooses grace and mercy over judgment. Life over death. And there's a wonderful surprise near the end of the story about Israel and Judah when they went into captivity. That there's more going on than human choices and hardness of heart and judgment. It's uh, God's grace is found even in his judgment. 
even in his judgment. His mercy is found even in his judgment. When uh, Israel, uh, Judah went into captivity to Babylon, I'm uh, just turning back to find the scripture I've noted down. It's Psalm 137. Psalm 137. Uh, they felt wretched, of course. They realized then, uh, you know, that they had made wrong choices. Psalm 137. They were in Babylon. And this hymn was written, or this psalm was written at that time, by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down, yea, we wept, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us captive required of us a song. And those who plundered us required of us mirth. Tell us a story about your country. Sing a song of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill or her cunning. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. They felt really wretched then. They were suffering. They were suffering. And there were people there who were telling them, we shouldn't put up with this. We should try to get out of here. Uh, stirring them up and so forth. And God told Jeremiah to write a letter to the Jews in exile. As in Jeremiah 29. And it shows that God wasn't against Israel, but they had to be shocked into a realization of what they were doing. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Uh, first of all, uh, <coughs> God told Isaiah to write uh, this letter. And uh, let's see. Verse 1, first of all. Now these are the words of the letter Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away. And uh, he sent the letter. Thus says the Lord of hosts in verse 4, the God of Israel, to all who were carried captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem. And he says, Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. So he, God was telling them here to pray for the city and the land they were captive in. Notice verse 11. For I know the thoughts I think towards you. Did God hate them? Was he going to dis destroy them? I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. God's mercy was there all the time. His love was deep. His arms were open. But they didn't see it. They didn't see it. And those things are written for our admonition, as Paul says. And maybe... Maybe some people feel, who are Christians, maybe they feel they've blown it, you know. They do something crazy and they think they've blown it. Perhaps a long series of choices has led some of us into our own place of exile. Well, we, we do pay for our choices. And we find ourselves out there in a sort of wilderness of maybe we feel we're, we feel that this or that and feel that they're sinning. And, but something can be happening during those long days of exile that we don't always see. 
something new slowly emerges. One writer put it this way, he said, we can only see God's purposes working out by looking in a rear view mirror. Looking in the rear view mirror of history, we can see that Israel's exile was in was its, its sad rest. It became as formative for her faith as the exodus from Egypt and the sojourn in the wilderness. It was out of the furnace of exile that a whole new theology was forged that strengthened and honed God's people for another 400 years after the exile finished. And all the historical books of the Old Testament and large portions of scripture were incubated during the exile. The, the books of Jeremiah and, and those Ezekiel, Daniel, they were written during the exile. And out of the desolation of exile, Israel experienced renewal. They experienced renewal. Although in a sense the exile continued until Christ came. Because no prophet, there was no voice of a prophet for the 400 years from the exile until Christ. And the same is true of our exiles, broken relationships, grief, maybe painful failures in family life, or drugs or whatever. All these things can be redeemed. All these things can be redeemed. When all our bad choices lead to hard hearts and brokenness, when doors seem to be closed or even to slam shut in our face, and judgment seems to rain down, then in God's grace, exile can still become a Sabbath for us. New possibilities can emerge because the door of grace always stands open. Really. God's arms are always open and he waits for us. No matter what tangled web we weave, no matter what tangled web we weave. And there may be scars that never quite fade. There may be regrets which remain. Uh, and other effects of, of our wrong choices which still cause us pain. But there is also the grace of a new beginning. The grace of a new beginning. New fruitfulness and hope for a future. Just as God said to the Jews that he had hope for them and a the future. And the first words of Jesus as you remember, as he instituted the, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, speak of grace in the midst of human sin. Remember his words in 1 Corinthians 11, as Paul records them, he says, on the night he was betrayed. Those words. He took bread. Now, those words point not only to the betrayal of Judas, but also to the faithless, craven fear of his disciples. And most of all, it points to the continued, continued rebellion of the Jews. They were God's people and they crucified God's last and greatest messenger, Jesus Christ. They crucified him, rejected him when he came to them. Our evil choices raised Jesus on the cross, but it was on the cross. It was on the cross we were all enabled to see him from afar. And God drew us and brought us to Jesus Christ. And it's through his shed blood that our sins are forgiven. All our sins are forgiven. And if we slip up, we go to God and confess that. And he forgives. He's faithful and merciful. Faithful and merciful. Remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. We don't need to turn to it. But Jesus told the story of the son who demanded his share of his father's wealth, squandered it in a far land, lived it up with prostitutes and good high living and all the rest of it, and finally came to experience his own exile and he had to feed pigs. And he was eating the pig food to try and survive, eating the pig food. And then the memory of the father's, his father's house and his love dawned on him. How even the servants had plenty to eat. They were well clothed. And he was a son. And he was probably worn clothes and no food. 
maybe sick, maybe sick, he was sick probably, and he determined to go home, ready to pay for his sins and fall on his father's mercy. And yet his father saw him long before he reached home, saw him coming and ran to meet him. And he embraced him. And even before he, he had planned what he would say, that he would say, I've sinned against heaven and before you, you remember that. Before he even was able to say that, his father embraced him and welcomed him home and called for the best clothing, put the ring on his finger and had a feast for his son. And this is God's message to us in the exiles we experience. No matter what we have done or how many bad choices we have made, God loves us. He loves every one of us. And he wants us to come home. He wants us to come home. There's an interesting thing we were looking at Revelation 2 and 3. And in Revelation 3, Revelation 3, remember, this was the, uh, the church of Laodicea, uh, where he said, and let's see now, I know your works, that you, verse 15, that you're neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eyes so that you may see. Here they're called to repentance, and they're, they're, they're really at the bottom. They're really at the bottom. And then he goes on to say, As many as I love I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and repent. But notice verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Holman Hunt is a pre requelite painter, artist, and he painted this and it's called The Light of the World. And it's in, you can see it in Oxford, you can see it in St. Paul's Cathedral. And it shows Christ standing with a lamp and he's knocking this door and it's all overgrown. There's ivy and tangle. It hasn't been open for years. And there's a bat even hanging from the ivy. And he's knocking the door. And that door, he doesn't kick it in and catch you by the scruff and say, you're going to do this. No, he's given us the dignity of choosing. And we have to open the door. How can we refuse to open the door with what God holds in front of us, a, beautiful, a wonderful future? What about a renewed earth and renewed universe? Mm -hmm. An earth unspoiled by filth and dirt and pollution. And we'll have a chance to remake it. The universe, the scientists, they can't, they see a little into it, but it's vast, it's vast. And yet goes to, it's going to be all remade, and we have a part in it. How could we not open the door to Christ? Brethren, keep the door to your heart, to that inner core. Keep it open to God and to Jesus Christ, and they will work in us and through us. And we'll be able to lift up others and edify other people instead of destroying their faith. Just think how wrong choices, bad examples affect others and how a good example builds somebody up. Let's keep that in mind and let's do that because that way we'll be acting for God. We'll be God's representatives. 
You hear about reps going around knocking doors, selling things. Well, we'd be more than say we'd be giving the most valuable thing away for nothing. For nothing. That's what we're. That's our job.